introduce our next speaker. Haven't known him in years, but in brief time I've known him. I've come to respect him and cherish his friendship. John West was with us just this past fall, I believe, and uh, in the meeting he did an outstanding job. He's got a tough assignment. I, at least I always counted a tough assignment when it says book review. That, that, that's uh, difficult to do. I it used to bring horror to, to my <laughs> to me when I had to do a book review in school. But I know John will do a good job. John and his wife Sonia are with us, and uh, their three children, one Jonathan and Joshua. He currently preaches for the Srigley. Am I saying that right? Srigley, Mr. Christ, and is uh, active in selling insurance. As I say, we're privileged to have John come our way. He's an outstanding preacher, and we appreciate him very much. John, come talk to us. Thank you, Brother Buddy. It is good here today. He mentioned book review, and I was asked to do one last year on a debate book. I enjoy reading debate books, but uh, the same thing came to mind when David sent me the assignment. I froze, and I said, surely he won't do it again. And then this year, the next assignment said book review. <laughs> I started to call and ask if I made you mad or something. <laughs> now, my teachers in school <clears throat> always told me about these book reviews, and so I was wondering what I've done to David. Now, I, I really am glad to be able to do this book review. I've I've heard a lot about the book, or I had heard a lot about it for years. Uh, after hearing a review of it uh, in a preacher meeting I attended, I decided I didn't want to spend the money, waste the money, in buying the book. And then back a few months ago, I had to. <laughs> well, now I've got it. I do want to thank David Brown for allowing me once again to be here on the lectureship. If I recall, I believe this is third or maybe fourth year, I believe fourth year. I've been here, and the association that, that we have now with the congregation as well as with the fine elders here, uh, we do appreciate everything that you are doing. I want to thank the elders also for allowing me to be here in the pulpit once again after having put up with me in the fall uh, during the gospel meeting. I do thank Brother Cone and Sister Cone for the use of a camper. Uh, this is the second year we've stayed in that, and the kids love it because, and we all love it, but the kids especially because it's like camping out. They they think we're on camping trips. So they're really thrilled about staying in the camper every year. And I do want to thank the ladies and all who have had food that has uh, been so good. Uh, Brother Ken started coming toward the doors. I opened and he said, I saw on the front the speaker. I said, I have to go get me a cookie. <laughs> have a snack for, for us. Let's get into our review of this book, the book Who is My Brother by Ethelgar Smith. Ethelgar has has written a few good books. We can't say that all books he has written are, are not good. He's written a good book on homosexuality, exposing that, a good book on the subject of abortion, as well as maybe a few others. He has written some other books, though, that were not so good that we have uh, in the past had to deal with. Uh, but this book, is one deal with so much error. I heard much about it, and I did put this in the book. I stuck it out, but I, I had to be somewhat fair to the man. He does have some good points in the book, and I will say that before I get into it. I'm going to deal primarily with the negative aspect, the false doctrine taught in it, but it does make some good points. You can't discount everything uh, in it, but as a whole, it's not a good book. I read half the first chapter, and I was waiting on something to jump out at me, and it didn't, so I started back over, and I read it again, and I said, I must have missed something. Well, after I got to that point again, I said, well, the same thing. It's, so, it's good so far. Well, I didn't have to go but one or two more pages, and then I, I got to where I was looking, uh, and it wasn't even looking. It just jumped right out at me. But he starts this thing. He's uh, three different parts in this book, and his first part is, in Quiet Revolution, and he started entitled the book The Quiet Revolution and changed it to Who is My Brother. But he starts this section with this particular theme. Chapter 1, he deals with a subject entitled A Clear and Present. And I will make this disclaimer as we get into it. We all see from time to time on various news reports or shows that uh, often appear that there are warning labels that are put up. That 
material may not be suitable for young viewers or for all viewers, or some, if it is of a graphic nature, might say that if you have a weak stomach, and our news station often does this, if you have a weak stomach, you might not want to view this next program. Well, if you have a weak stomach, you may want to go ahead and, and leave now before we get any further in the lesson, because if you have a weak stomach, then uh, you may have a hard time dealing with what we're going to be looking at in this book. Chapter 1, A Clear and Present Day. He does showing that all that are unique to the Church of Christ, there have been none more central than the absolute necessity of adult faith-prompted baptism for the remission of sins. Sounds good. And there's a general statement is concerned, but he goes on. I'm going to say in a, a positive way here as well in this chapter, one's view of baptism contributes significantly to one's view of it. Now, that's not always the case, but in some cases it is. He further states that a new generation within the church can achieve unity at the sacrifice of, quote, clear doctrinal teaching on the matter of baptism. Normally, he states, such a radical abandonment of settled doctrine could not occur without more controversy. Oddly enough, he states, there have been more opposition to the instrument in women preachers than there have been to accepting denominational baptism and fellowship in denominations. Well, he does say the reason that is, is the instrument is, is obvious. It's out here in front of you. You can't help but see it when you come in the building. When a woman stands up to preach, it's, it's visible. You can't help but see that. But there may be cases of those who enter the building, I mean, they are Christians or members of the Lord's Church, who have not been baptized into Christ, who came from the nation and said, I've had permission of sins, and they're often accepted in. And he said, that's why we're having some of these problems. But then he goes into another section under this same chapter, in this same chapter, uh, and type questions, harder answers. Now, it seems like Lagarde has a, a hard time dealing with some questions and answers. Now, these, these are pretty clear cut to me, and it will be to you as well. But he has a hard time with this. He asks about... This this brother, he said, what about a brother who sits next to us in the pew on Sunday morning, knowing we will not be back Sunday night nor Wednesday night? Do we fellowship him? Do we fellowship this man? But we refuse to extend fellowship to our spiritually minded friend simply because they have not been biblically baptized. The closer to home it comes, the more complicated it gets. That's not complicated. And I unbaptized person, though he may claim faith in Christ, makes him no more than a Christian than it does if you took a duck and dumped him out of the water to make him one. But that's the way some of these folks want it. That's why Lagarde does. Now, it's interesting as you read these things. We refuse fellowship to a spiritually minded friend simply because they've never been biblically baptized. But what did he already say? We've already quoted earlier in pages 19 and 20 of the book that people have done away with a clear-cut doctrinal teaching of adult faith-prompted baptism for the remission of sins. He's already contradicted himself in the first chapter. We might as well take this and just throw it out, and we can go on and have a good little break for the next few minutes and go get you several good deed. We don't have to go any further. We know this is a, a false view and false doctrine. Now, if a guard is, uh, has been and is known widely as a lawyer. I would hate to have this man defending me in the case if this is the way he argues. And that's the way he does argue throughout this end of the book. He will make a statement that on the service is a good statement. Then he will turn around and contradict that very statement. Does it all through it? Go to chapter 2. I don't have time to deal with it in detail. There are several quotes in the book that uh, you may want to take the time to read, but I don't have time to go through them all now. Chapter 2, he has a chapter entitled, The Ghost of Faith, or Faith Only Arguments Past. He uses an illustration of a well-known, well-respected preacher, at least in his own estimation, at a large congregation who basically preaches faith only. He said this well-known man talks about uh, preachers and others in re different religions, such as Billy Graham, John Stott, uh, Tony Campolo, James Dobson, and calls these men as men who have given their lives for Christ. He's a little upset and bothered that this man at this well-known church, although he will refuse to call him, said, quote, faith in Christ alone is winning salvation. He answers this by saying, quote, any preacher in the mainline churches of Christ, or for any preacher in the mainline churches of Christ, to make such a statement should be shocking in and of itself. Yes, it is. 
But statements that Smith makes in his own books are just as equally as shocking. So he may not say he's faith only. Later on we'll see he accepts faith only um, by some of the things he does. He makes a good statement, and I had to put this in, uh, in trying to answer some of this faith only doctrine. He says, water, water everywhere, and all the faith only arguments did shrink. Well, that's true. There's a lot of water in the Bible, and there's a lot about baptism, and it does make those faith only arguments not only shrink, but completely dissolve. Well, as we're going to see later, from this chapter, chapter 3, uh, it's entitled, Not by Oversight Express, or Overnight Express. He talks about a real problem that we're facing in fellowship. And he believes the real problem, and I believe he has a lot of this uh, very aptly stated, quote, rampant biblical illiteracy evident among a fellowship of believers who want or known for being a people of the book is the reason of the problem. That's true. Ignorance and apathy. Now, I believe he has a little of both when it comes to the way he deals with this subject matter and the way he contradicts himself. And I don't mean no disrespect to the man. I have heard him. I've never personally met him, but I've heard him speaking on occasion. Uh, Fred Hardman lectures, when I'd gone to those, I'd sat in a couple of his lectures intentionally just to see what he was saying. Uh, those were on abortion or homosexuality and had good lectures. But as far as meeting him personally, I have not, and I don't have any ill will toward him. But I do not agree or condone what is written in the book and cannot. But let's go further. Toward the end of this chapter, and I'm not going to deal much with chapter 3, just want to state this last thing about chapter 3. He talks about the hermeneutics, beautiful principles which many follow, both old and new hermeneutics, and new the liberals follow. And he says, what do we need? Which one will be better, the old or the new? He said, we need both. We need both the old and the new, because that just brings everything together. And here's a quote from him. The truth is, we need both the object, which I put in the book, the old, and the subjective, which he means as the new. Both it and both fact and story, both church oration and Christ-centeredness, both law and grace. Now think just a moment. I started scratching my head, a little hair I got left. I must scratch some of that off. I started scratching a little of that when I read that statement. I was thinking, now why do we need the new? His implication in this section is, that the old is only objective, the old is only the head, the old is only fact, the old is only church orientation, the old is only law. But the new hermeneutic is subjective, which it is. Uh, it is heart. I last read my Bible, I find it and heart in it. I find how we follow with the head or we follow uh, logically thinking processes as we study. But it also allows the heart. Does the Bible not teach that as well? That's not a new hermeneutic. But he thinks the new hermeneutic has to deal with the heart. So if you've got the old hermeneutic or the hermeneutic we follow in the past, you have no heart. Going further, fact and story. The Bible shows both. Both church orientation. Notice it's Christ-centeredness. So if you don't believe in the new hermeneutic, not centered. That's the implication. I don't know if that's exactly what he wanted to come out and say, but that's what he said. The new hermeneutic means you're not Christ-centered, or the, rather the old, if you believe the old. So it takes the new to get you Christ-centered. Don't believe that. Both law and grace. Grace in the new? I find grace in the New Testament along with law. We don't need a new hermeneutic to give us the grace along with the old hermeneutic giving us the law. We have it both on it. He needs to understand that. Along with the brethren. Chapter entitled An Uncommon Cause. To the faithful Christian, I believe the lines of fellowship and faithfulness are, are very clear. They're black. There, there are no fuzziness or fuzzy lines. Nephilim Smith and some of his followers and some of his group, the lines are very fuzzy. He makes them fuzzy by not understanding difference between social and moral and uh, differenti differentiating between those and spiritual and Christian functions. I said that to say this. Page 65 of the book, notice what he stated. Quote, on several occasions, I have been asked to speak at fundraising at local crisis pregnancy centers supported largely by evangelicals. There is much discussion about the best way to fight a board and deal with moral issues. At the banquet, I have been touched by the poignant expressions of Christian faith which have been punctuated, or which have punctuated the evening. Sadly, members of the churches of Christ are nowhere 
there inside. I find myself alongside other believers who share a sense of the same responsibility. Conscientious, dedicated believers, and in many cases, unbaptized believers. Now, I'll take offense to a lot of the things he states in that. I don't have time. I think I could spend the whole less than one paragraph. But just notice some of the things he's saying in this. He can't differentiate between a social function and a religious function. He's talking to a local pregnancy crisis center, trying to teach folks how to talk these young girls and women out of having abortions. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That needs to take place. Abortion needs to stop in our country. And I think all of us would agree. But to say that since it's run largely by people who who are in their belief, and there are nowhere in sight members of the Church of Christ, that he has a right to use that as a, a means of fellowship biblically with these people. Notice something he states in this, if you didn't catch it. I have much by the point, expressions of Christian faith. Did you catch that just a moment ago and read it? Christian faith, and he even tells you that they're unbaptized believers, they're not Christians, but they are Christians again. I wouldn't want him defending me in a court trial. That's the way he argues. He works alongside other believers, other believers. So he, as a member of the Church of Christ, supposedly a Christian, working alongside other believers who are unbaptized, he says he has fellowship with them. And he has more in common with them than he does the average member of the Church of Christ. That doesn't say anything about us as much as it does about he finds those common grounds and he wants to make that the commonality with them rather than with members of the Lord's church. Unbaptized believers. Go figure. I think that's self-explanatory. You look at John 24, Hebrews 11, Romans 10. Look at the passages on faith. It shows, it shows us, or they show us, the faith that is there in order to be pleasing to God. In this same chapter, he praises the Promise Keeper movement. When it first started, he said he was thrilled and overjoyed. The fact that 50,000 men could, get, could gather in a football stadium, hug and cry and pray together. And how wonderful that was. Well, he said but he couldn't agree with some things. He ultimately comes down to the fact that he can't support the Promise Keeper movement. It took him about two pages in the book stating how great they are and why they, they need to be in existence and they need to be doing all these great works, but I can't support them because of promise number six. They said that in that, in part, you have to go beyond denominational barriers, and he said, I just can't do that. And another statement, uh, he has a box in the, in the book that he put out with their plan of salvation, the old Baptist plan of salvation of their faith only, saying confession, your sinner's prayer, after you've already received Jesus in your heart, he said he can't go along with that. So he finally admits that supporting uh, or not supporting this issue is a tough one. What is it? it hasn't been for me. When I saw the Promise Keepers movement come out, I knew from the very beginning it was wrong. I don't care if you have 50 million men in a, in a state getting kissed and crying or whatever they're doing. It's still wrong because of the teachings that they are following. Well, going further, chapter 5. Now, I haven't seen anyone leave, so I guess your stomach is held up to this point. But I want to go ahead and give you another warning. It only hurts. So if you're getting weak and you're starting to get nauseous, then go ahead and get up because it's about to get a lot worse. Chapter 5, again, section to book. Where he begins just five levels of fellowship. And level one fellowship of chapter five is entitled Universal Fellowship, the family of man. And in this, he believes that all of us are brothers and sisters just by the fact that we're human. We're part of the human race. If we're part of the human race, we're all brothers and sisters of the human race. I noticed at the beginning of chapter, he has a small quote in italics and a tribute to whoever made the quote. And in the beginning of this chapter, he has a quote by Brother Marshall Keaton, one of the few, if maybe the only member of the Lord's church that he quotes, that he, where he says, if I miss him in Christ, I'll hit him in Adam. 
Some of those things have been taken out of context, some of our brethren. And I know that people wasn't meaning the way old Lagarde here means it. I heard a, a preacher, John Henry Clay, just before he died, who was baptized by Brother Keeble. And he made a similar statement to a Methodist preacher in the audience. I was a Methodist preacher to read a Bible verse referring to baptism or immersion or the remission of sins. And then when he went through, got through with that point, he pointed at him and said, now you get my point. Now he got it intentionally and he said, Brother Reed. And he stopped and he said, wait a minute, I want to clarify something. And he made this statement of Brother Keeble. And he said, I don't imply this man is my brother. He's not. He's part of the human race. And I'm allowing the man to read to make my point. But he didn't know, the Methodist preacher at the time didn't know, that Brother Clay was using him to show the fallacy of his own doctrine. Not to fellowship him like Jack F. Lagarde Smith tells us we need to do. But that's exactly what F. Lagarde does in this particular chapter. He believes that since we are human, not monkeys, Jeff, or in the monkey, we're human, brothers and sisters, he calls us, that we're in the family of man fellowship. He tries to use an illustration with uh, the Samaritan woman. Jesus being at the well, the Samaritan woman coming to draw water. And without going through that story, you know the account of that, uh, the biblical account of what happened. Here's what Smith says about this. Jesus, quote, Jesus response might as well have been, don't you know I can't serve you unless I first fellowship you? Yeah, he might as well said, uh, unless you want to be a good close in the mind and take me out to eat and you just not unless you go jump over the well without falling in, I can't do this. That's not what Jesus said. He might as well sell a million things, but he didn't. And forever to read into what is in this Bible is just simply false doctrine again. But but some love it. Some love our writings. Don't you notice this in page 87? Whom God has called us to fellowship, we have no right to refuse. On the most basic threshold, we have universal fellowship with everyone who believes. Universal fellowship is with everyone that believes. Well, this is interesting. If you're going down that book, he has a section entitled, Not Without Limits. Now, I want to read this to you from the book. Universal fellowship does not mean, of course, that we cannot have personal preferences. We don't have to choose everyone who walks down the street as a close friend. Well, you don't have to choose them as a close friend, but you, according to him, must consider him or her your brother or sister fellowship him or her. Nor does universal fellowship mean that we cannot, quote, disfellowship members of the human race who violate the law and become a threat to others. Wait a minute. That again contradicts what he had just stated that I just read, whom God called us a fellowship, we have no right to refuse. On the most basic threshold level, we have universal fellowship with everyone who believes. If we have it with everyone who believes, how can he turn around right below that two or three weeks later and say, we can his fellowship, some we don't want to fellowship? And more contradictions. Now, we know the biblical doctrine draw a fellowship. And if he's trying to bring that principle in, well and good. But he's already contradicted himself by saying God commands us to fellowship everyone who breathes. And we've got to fellowship everyone who breathes. But we don't have to choose to fellowship everyone who breathes. Somebody breaks the law with the fellowship and we disfellowship them. He's already contradicted himself once again. Chapter 6, level 2. Faith fellowship. Like family. Now get this. Don't you listen to it. And he, he closes the end of chapter 5 by introducing this point. In chapter 6, he calls it faith fellowship. That means someone with a common faith who believe in Jesus as the Son of God, basically. They're a like family. In this chapter, and Brother Chumley referred to this just a moment ago, Smith writes about his experiences in England. He finds a chapel with a sign, Ashton Underhill Free Church. He said it caught his attention. He couldn't stand it. He had to stop in to worship one Sunday morning. Later on, by the way, I'll jump ahead some uh, because I wouldn't mention it anyway. He, he mentions, though, that the reason he started going to this particular church, it was too far to drive to the Church of Christ. Uh, it, it was a long distance. And because of long distance, it was easier to stop there and Brother Chamley shaking his head because he knows better. But that was his excuse for going to this particular church. Now, going further, it's, 
page 101 of the book, he learns that they are a church that's not in any particular group, but as a local, independent, and autonomous congregation which has about 50 members with godly elders overseeing its work. If they were godly elders, they wouldn't be part of a denomination. Yet he believes they're still godly. He states, quote, each first day of the week they gather able the Lord, for the Lord's Supper. But he said, much more for than this sham that we have, and that's my term, not his, but that's his intentions, what we do in the locker. He said, it's just a mockery the way we do it. They have so much meaning. They put so much into the Lord's Supper. It's not a five or ten minutes in occurrence. It's a good 30 minutes to an hour occurrence. And you really put everything with the Lord's Supper the way they do it. They're so spirited. It just makes them feel like he was in the first century. Well, if he'd have been there, Brother Paul would have took care of him. And on one occasion, he said he was present at a baptism, which was done with such emphasis and thoughtfulness that it would put our all too perfunctory baptisms to shame. And that's a quote from At some point, if you didn't know better, had not already read the name of the church, you would think he's talking about a local church of Christ, the way he's building it up, that they're doing everything exactly the way we're doing it. By the way, Brother Chemley informed me just a few minutes ago before this lesson uh, that Keith Sisman and Brother Graham had gone and found out that it's not anywhere close. A lot of differences. But if you read Apple Gore, he'd make you think it's Church of Christ without the name, other than what we're about to talk about. And this is the point that bothers him the most. Is that they do worship with an instrument. Now, in the past, I don't know if he still is, but in the past, he would spend six months out of the States and six months out of the year in England. During his six months in England, he would worship with the Asheville Church. Not with the Church of Christ, but with a denomination. Who, as he admits, uses the instrument. As for the instrument, he states, I try to content myself with the thought that while everyone else is singing with the instrument, get this phrase now, or this statement, I try to content myself with the thought while everyone else is singing with the instrument, I was singing without them. There's somebody banging on that piano up front, and he's singing without it, but they're singing with it. Again, how many of y'all, raise your hand, how many want him as your lawyer to defend you in a case? If that's the kind of argument he uses. He said, of course, that didn't solve the problem for someone like myself who is so strongly opposed to instrumental music and worship. Catch that? <laughs> Their presence continually marred by an otherwise uh, inevitable worship ideal. He's strongly opposed to instrumental music and worship. And he closes his eyes and imagines that instrument, that instrument's not there. I guess if he says it enough, it just disappears. Well, he doesn't, and it doesn't. It's still there. He does state that they allowed him to speak, and, and very discreetly. He didn't want to come out and condemn them, but very discreetly in a sermon that they allowed him to present, that the instrument made him uncomfortable. Now, he's in the book, he is strongly opposed, but in his sermon, he just... And a side mention, he's uncomfortable with it. So, on occasions when he is asked to speak, he states in the book, the singing is done a cappella. Or if they ask him to lead a song, the singing is done a cappella. Just for his conscience. Well, he doesn't much if he stayed there. Let's go for I'm running out of time. Under the second... The practical meaning of faith fellowship, Smith states this, it has taken a group of believers in a little, little English chapel to arrest my attention and teach me more perfectly the meaning of worship. Now, I guess all of us need to go to denomination and learn how to worship according to that. But it's more telling. He states this, what else do I need to learn, perhaps from the Pentecostals, about what it means to give myself over to a more emotional expression of my faith? Or from the Quaker, about listening more closely to God through meditative silence. Hold on, I'm going to hear him. I had not heard God speak yet, but undoubtedly he thinks he does. From the Anglicans, about a greater zeal for doing social justice, or from the Dutch Calvinists, about thinking more Christianly in all that I do, or from the Catholics, about a greater need for confessing my soul God. What happened to finding a group of Christians we pattern our lives and find examples. What about the good example of the Apostle Paul? What about Peter, James, John? More importantly than that, what about 
our Savior Jesus Christ and the example that He left. Why not follow that? Why go to the Quakers, the Catholics? Why go to denominational folks to learn how to be Christian and a faithful one at that? It's just amazing the depth to which brethren have sung. Chapter 7 is entitled, In Christ Fellowship. The extended family. These are, notice, in Christ fellowship. And when you read the and it tells those who are in Christ, they are Christians. But he starts this chapter by talking about an experience of worshiping in Jerusalem for three weeks with a group of Messianic Jews. Not Christians. Messianic Jews. Jews who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but not the local church of Christ in Jerusalem. Not among Christians. And here's what he states. The worship on the first day of the week consists of prayer, singing, teaching from the Scriptures, but especially for gathering around the Lord's table in memory of the crucified Savior. He states that worship with them is like going back 2,000 years to the first century. After three weeks of sharing and fellowship with these Jewish brothers and sisters who are, according to this chapter, in Christ, not members of the Lord's church, but in Christ, I almost had to pinch myself to make sure I wasn't back in the first century attending the crucial Jerusalem conference in which significant differences between Jewish and Gentile believers had to be hammered out. And he states that while they are using the Scriptures, they use the Torah, and they debate, and he said their worship is a debate-type worship very often, very lively-type worship, according to him, where they are hammering out differences or questions or discussions in a very lively manner. But going further, we know we had to forsake the assembly to do that. But that doesn't seem to bother him because he does it six months out of the year in England. In a section entitled, Who Are My Brothers? Smith asked if we'd be ashamed to call publicly baptized believers our brothers. Now here's his, just mentioned, from Boston Movement, Disciples of Christ, Christian Church. Now you show me especially the Disciples of Christ and Christian Church where they are baptized in a manner. They're not. That's already been dealt with. Don't even need to touch on it. He turns out 19 and refers to John's baptism. Although, remember those who had John's baptism, when Paul came, they were baptized scripturally. He doesn't mention this. But he says the one that poses the most problem for us today is the modern day Baptist. Because other than the faith only and a few other few doctrines, the Baptists are almost just like us. They believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. They do believe in baptism by immersion, although he states that they're wrong when they do it. He says they're close to us. He believes the modern Baptist is the closest parallel to Acts 19 that we have anywhere in the New Testament, anywhere that we're dealing with today or with anyone. He admits, though, the New Testament doesn't teach this, but it's close. There are a lot of things that are close. We might wait that are close, but unless we find it, it doesn't matter how close it is. It's just not going to count. Here's the What makes such a hypothesis so awkward is there is no express biblical warrant for guaranteeing salvation on the basis of such time-delayed baptisms. Search with a fine-tooth comb and you'll never find a New Testament believer or disciple being baptized because they were already Christians. So why would anyone want to fly standby when they can just as easily fly confirmed? And how can any collective body of believers resolutely perpetrate biblical and understanding of baptism. Now he calls it unbiblical. But he said they're close to Acts 19. Having written so strongly in earlier chapters about the error of faith-only salvation, it certainly gives me no comfort, comfort now to suggest that such error might nevertheless be overcome at the point of baptism. Even though they didn't understand when, why they were baptized, the point of baptism is away with a faith-only doctrine. God fooled them and threw them in the church and they didn't even know it, basically. Notice this, though, but I see no brighter line to form. This is very telling. Given the type of baptism which is unbiblical in understanding, yet biblical in obedience, we are caught on the horns of a dilemma in the gray area between faith fellowship and in Christ fellowship. Now, how are we caught on the horns of dilemma between these two? It's very easy. They are not Christians. They have not been, and as long as they stay in that situation, they never will be. They have to come out of sectarianism, denominationalism, and obey the unadulterated, pure gospel of Jesus Christ, stand in the one church, and be converted to Christ before they're saved. They're, 
the way he is talking, they're already saved, but he still has some problems with it. Level four, I must hurt. Well, too quickly. <laughs> conscience fellowship, which is close family. He mentioned several things in his opinion are just matters of conscience. Number of cups, use wine or grape juice in the Lord's Supper. Premillennial, postmillennial, or millennial. Does it matter? He goes through and stating that knowing there's little, ex little if any acceptance of these Calvinistic doctrines among churches of Christ, I use them simply to establish the principle that even significant doctrinal differences do not automatically disenfranchise a person from the body fellowship. They know what does. I guess denying Jesus came to flesh, according to him later on, that will be one of the things. Chapter 9, congregational fellowship, immediate family. He said this is real family. Real family. The others are close. But this is real family, other than the extended family on in Christ. He says these people are people who worship together, they pray together, study together, eat together, laugh together, and cry together. This is your congregation. This is the fellowship in the congregation. But he said those lines are even blurred. He talks about where he attended out in California. He even admitted being the token conservative in such a liberal congregation and how the elders on several occasions had received letters from him and his disdain for things going on in the congregation. But he just didn't need to leave. Get out further. Another thing is the fact that uh, if he was abandoning his brothers and sisters with whom he had worshipped for so many years. Now here are people who he admitted are wrong in what they do, yet he couldn't find himself leaving them. He needed to stay there. And he by staying there and maybe letters to the elders and the token conservative I hate to see the rest of them open conservative, but by being the token conservative, that he not bring about change, although he never did. Chapter 10 deals with another section, and in this section, chapter 10 is entitled Discipline of Disfellowship. I'm not going to take time to go through that. He talks about the Collinsville, Oklahoma incident back in the 80s, and how the elders did the right thing, but they did the wrong thing. They did the right thing in withdrawing from her, but the wrong thing in sending letters out is nobody else. That's his business. No other congregation should have known about it. Uh, you don't do that. Your own family, your own church family, as he puts it, you deal with them in a private manner, even though it's a public assembly. You're still dealing with them with your own congregation. Your own, if you don't everybody else's family and tell them your family business, neither should you do the same in the Lord's church, according to him. Number 11, false of teaching. Uh, he whines and cries about being written up in Tennessee. Uh, there's a full pad, undoubtedly, that appeared in some a little small town in Tennessee where he was scheduled to appear. Some brethren got together and, and accused him of not believing in hell and accepting people who are not baptized. We've already seen he's done that, uh, as well as the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, as he puts it. But he goes on in the very next page of the book and states, well, who am I to say that God doesn't work in other ways with the Holy Spirit than the written word? And who am I to say and God decides to send one to hell, he doesn't immediately annihilate them? Well, they had an accurate assessment of his beliefs. He whined about it, then turned it, that's what he believed. Although he didn't want to call that an admittance. Michael Hatcher, I know, is now watching. He's not with us in the assembly this, this afternoon. Uh, how do you need to uh, restudy Second John 9, according to F. Lagarde? F. Lagarde believes you missed it, and everyone else who would agree. Ephesians 5.11, Romans 16, 2 John 9, passages we've dealt with on uh, dealing with false teachers and marking them. He says that Ephesians 5 and Romans 16 deal only with lifestyles, not doctrine. So we don't have a right to talk about how false doctrine plays a significant role in most so-called false teachers. And they're not a false teacher unless they say something about lifestyle changes, which I guess he would say homosexuality and abortion would be the two that he's looking at. But in this he states that he sees the problem as a character problem, but then he admits it's not just teaching, but doing something wrong. Again, another contradiction. He said it's nothing to do with teaching. Then he turned around and said it's not only teaching, but it's doing wrong. Figure once again. Oh, I'm not through yet. Well, chapter 12. <clears throat> and I've still got Max Licato's letter to go, so... Chapter 12, The Prospect of Eternal Fellowship. We've been talking about this in the back. I don't have time to deal with this. But his conclusion of the God has the prerogative to save who he wants. My business, do the Great Commission. None of your business who God's going to save. You let God sort them all out in the end, and everything's going to be wonderful. And we're going to see 
people in heaven that are not members of the Church of Christ, very likely, because God has a pro the prerogative to grant clemency. So since he's a lawyer, he wants to argue from the judicial standpoint, and judges can grant clemency a court system, therefore God will do the same. Now, I can't help what crooked, underhanded judges do when they want to grant clemency, or they want to, or juries as well, excuse people who commit crimes, but God will hold everyone accountable who commits sin and lives in sin. I don't have time to get to Max's letter. I did not put it in much because I originally intended on spending a good bit of portion on that in the lesson today, but there was so much to go over, I decided to kind of call of it. But Max's letter, he writes Max a letter and says, I didn't write to stroke your ego, even though you're wonderful and great, one of the greatest Christian writers. I want to talk to you about your belief about baptism and how you've kind of shunned that and from that, he wants to scold Max for stating, stating that you don't have to be baptized for the mission of sins, although Smith then wants to fellowship people who have not been baptized for the mission of sins. He contradicts himself all through the letter. He condemns Max Licato for what he's doing and turns around and practices the very same thing. How dare him? He ought to apologize to Max Licato for that several pages he wrote him because he does the same thing Max Licato does. This is a very brief, if you notice in the book, just 30 something pages. This is very brief. I did I did not have time to, to go through it. And I say that as brief because considering the content of this, I skipped several things in here that I'd like to have dealt with, but constraints and time constraints, I did not have time to do that. But I would encourage you, Brother Daniel Denham, I believe was it back in 1998 on the Bellevue Lectures on Fellowship. He did almost a 100-page review of this very book. So I would encourage you to get either the CD or the Bellevue book of 1998 and uh, have a very thorough uh, review of that because Brother Denham did an excellent job on that particular lesson. I do thank you for your attention today. John, I'm somewhat disappointed. Here I was all primed up to go buy that book. <laughs> Couldn't help but think when one of the sections you were in where I think he used the words, some of these folks are real close. Real close. Well, I guess it's still a true as you overwork, but I always heard that close only counts in horseshoe hand grenades, right? It, it, it just boggles your mind, doesn't it? The, 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 the liberties that they take with the, with the scriptures and just laying their own interpretation on it, uh, it's just simply amazing. Anyway, John, did an excellent job on that. Uh, I say, I don't think I need to buy the book now. I really don't. We stand adjourned now until uh, the bottom of the hour.